Okay. So, couple. Uh, here's a couple announcements. The jungle is due tomorrow, but I said to you one more day. It's due Tuesday. It's due on. I'll, I'll, I'll give you till Thursday, okay? Partly because I decided I, I do need to talk about the Boxer Rebellion. And so I figured, ah, oh, I'll give you one more day on that. Next, you do have to have the rest of chapter 20 read. And so there's a reading assignment for today, but I'm not going to sign that till tomorrow because I'm going to wait till, because I'm moving everything down one day. Is that good for everybody? Yes. Next. Look what I found. Huh? What smells? It smiles back. What does smile back? I think it smells bad. Are you kidding me? I don't want to know what you believe. Moving on. Who would like these? You don't want them? They're fine. I don't need to have one back. She's not. I'll take each. Don't lose them. I'm not responsible for your snack. I think you found them to the nuts. <laughs> All right, so uh, the jungle will be tomorrow. Let's. Uh, where do we finish? Did we get to this treaty of uh, Paris? Mm -hmm. did, I, did we get to Spam? Yes. Who, what killed most uh, U.S. soldiers in the Spanish-American War? Disease. Or disease. And what was the amendment that said uh, Cuba will be independent, but never really defined that? Uh, yeah, and. Teddy Roosevelt, what was the unit he created? Rough, rough, riders. rough Riders. But he, before he left the Navy Department, that this is before there was a Department of Defense, before he left the Navy Department, he would make the order, take great credit for the order on the attack on what colony? The yeah, the Philippines. And we saw the cats boxing? Yes. Yes. We get to this? Okay, let's get Treaty of Paris. Treaty of Paris, 1898. Cuba, independence. But once again, define independence. The U.S. is going to stay there for for five more years, and then come back many more times. Puerto Rico and Guam would become American colonies, still American colonies. And the U.S. is going to pay. Okay, clearly I had something on my mind when I typed this, and I thought it was funny, so I left it. I had this on my mind, and so we got spam. So just like the Treaty of Guadalupe and Hildago, which ended the Mexican War, the U.S. paid for the Philippines to act like it's not a war for empire, we just happened to buy the Philippines. Hmm. Nobody was more shocked about this than what people? Yeah, the Filipinos, who really thought they were going to be independent, and also the American soldiers came and occupied it that summer. It's going to take a while, but they will begin to fight back. Almost immediately, though, it turned into a fight. Secretary of State John Hay signed this in Paris, but the Senate has got to ratify a treaty, and it requires two-thirds of the Senate. That's constant in the Constitution. It's hard to get two thirds. Is the United States going to become an empire? And all the things that go with it. Big army, wars, a secret government, because you need spies and a secret police. All of those things. What kind of country is the United States going to be? So this turned into a big battle about the Senate. I only need, uh, what, 33 senators to stop this bill, or 30 senators to stop this bill. But the propaganda began immediately. So here's a poster showing now the new United States, July 4th, 1898, after the Spanish were basically defeated. Hawaii was annexed. And look at the faces now. Remember the damsels in distress I showed you before? Now look at the faces. This is to justify saying they can't govern themselves. Hawaii, 
Cuba, Philippines. That's a big shift. And though this is not a rare cartoon, articles and cartoons like this you can find everywhere. Let me give you another one. Remember, now it's saying they're incapable of government, governing using social Darwinism and racism, that hierarchy of race. Here, this is 1899. Once again, this is for ratifying the treaty. It shows President McKinley standing or sitting on the soapbox and like he's a schoolmaster, having to deal with a bunch of unruly kids. And look at the kids, Puerto Rico, Philippines, Hawaii, and look how they draw Cuba. Look at the faces. There are reasons they did it that way. So he's using this hierarchy of race idea to say we have no choice but to civilize. And remember I showed you those pair of soap ads? And now they used um, like kind of social Darwinistic ideas. That was not just a rarity. That idea about soap and the civilizing nature was used all over. Here it says soap. Have you used it? Implying how clean the United States is and these dirty people will help civilize. Well, there was a pretty vibrant anti imperialist league. And they felt like they would lie to the teller of the moon. Some of the leaders were Samuel Gompers of the American Federation of Labor, the famous author Mark Twain. Andrew Carnegie had just sold Carnegie Steel and. <coughs> He became the richest man in the world. He would offer to buy the Philippines for $10 million to give up their independence. He was an interesting guy. And William Jennings Bryan ran for president in 1896. Bryan really thought this would be a campaign issue. So they're against the Philippines. I'm sorry, against imperialism, focusing on the Philippines. Therefore, don't ratify the treaty. Don't ratify the treaty. So here's uh, an imperialist league meeting. Here's trying to show, I'll get to this in a second. Let's jump the gun. The big reasons were, first one, just like Cleveland's argument to not annex Hawaii, the United States should stand for self-determination. Self-determination said, let people decide their own governments. Now, the United States had an iffy um, history of that, but the claim was the U.S. started from out of an empire. We wanted independence because it was for our liberty. We should allow other places to do that, too. This is what Americanism is. Once again, what kind of country are we going to be? Also, there's an argument that these other people, those really racist comments about these darker skinned people are going to come and steal our jobs. And this fit in with the nativist arguments that are already happened, and I showed you that before. And this should remind you a little bit of the draft riots. Remember back in 1863 during the Civil War, where workers roamed the streets attacking African Americans, thinking, free the slaves, we'll take our jobs. But also, the thought was this is going to lead to even more corporate and monopoly power and more war. So here's workers stopping the pig here. It's supposed to be monopoly. It's just monopoly right there. It's a corporation using imperialism to dominate the world. And once again, I can't emphasize this enough. Imperial powers go to war all the time. They expand the military significantly. That means more money that could go to other things go to the military. Imperial powers have to have a secret government. A government in the shadows. They need spies to protect their empire. And they need a secret police. By the way, we have all of that now. What is the secret police in the United States? The CIA spies outside the borders, even though since it's secret, we don't know how to What is it? Yeah. FBI. FBI is secret police. And that's not necessarily good or bad. It's a big change, though. You can make your decision whether or not that's good or bad. Well, William Jennings Bryan, though, dropped his opposition in the late winter of 1899. He thought, it's a done deal. Let's move on. I'm going to run against McKinley in 1900. 
And by doing that, Democrats who were kind of wavering, once Brian dropped, they voted for him. And that was the vote in the Senate. It was pretty close, but not enough to stop the treaty. So the treaty was ratified in the US, changed forever. We're a different country now. We became an imperial power. Brian's reputation dropped like a rock. There is mocking him like a gesture against imperialism and actually tying him to the Boxer Rebellion, which we'll get to, and Filipinos, which we'll get to. His reputation never recovered. He looked like a hypocrite or like a fool. And it never recovered. He's going to maintain this high level of popularity, but not enough to be president. Never recovered. It was a foolish political move. He should have kept up his opposition because then he would have looked like he's standing up for what he believed. So at that, but what do we do with these new places? There's going to be a series of court cases, three biggies that will get to the Supreme Court called the Insular case. Insular means like an island. Insular. Island. And the biggie is, does the Constitution follow the flag? So the Constitution at least for people who are not American Indians, follow the flag when it went west. No American Indians did not have those rights. Do people, though, of Puerto Rico or the Philippines or Hawaii, do they have rights under the Bill of Rights? We planted the flag. Do they have those rights? Does the 14th Amendment and the Bill of Rights apply? And here is one. It says, troubles which may follow an imperial policy and that's the Philippines using all kinds of, of stereotypes, throwing spears, and that's supposed to be like Congress. What do we do with this? But here's the biggie. Are we going to allow for at least what we now call democracy, where we let people decide their rulers and the people are ultimately in power? Can you have a democracy in areas that you colonize? Because this might shock you. The people in the Philippines actually wanted to be independent. They didn't want to be an American colony. Well, the Supreme Court is going to rule. And this is really important. Because by doing that, it set up a gray area. Does the Constitution follow where we conquer, where we have military bases, where we have troops, where we have the flag? Or do the people there, can they be treated as lesser? This is a big deal. We will come back to this in just a second, but I'll give you an example of this right now. But these are still kind of the law, but it's a very much a gray area. So how do we show this gray area? 1903, the Platinum. The US was gonna leave Cuba. It's independent, but is it? Platinum, Orville Flapp, uh, Senator Orville Flapp would propose this. And basically what it says is Cuba is gonna become a protector. It is, it will be independent, but they have no real self-government. For example, they can have no treaties or agreements with any other countries. They must do what the United States says. So here's implying, it says, kind of encouraging little Cuba to become independent, but they're not ready yet. It says Cuban independence, it's Cuba. <coughs> but that's not all. The U.S. said we can intervene anytime. That means send in the military anytime the United States wants. So we're telling Cuba, you don't do what we want. We'll send in the military. And to intimidate the Cubans to do what we want, but also it's a tr uh, strategic spot, in eastern Cuba, they must lease a naval base called Guantanamo Bay to the United States. So that means there's always powerful U.S. forces right next to Havana, or relatively close. We're on the same island. Cuba doesn't do what we want. We got troops right there. Imperial powers always do this. They build forts or castles. The, the greatest castles in the world, at least in my opinion, because I like castles, are in Wales. England built all these castles in Wales to make sure that Wales did not rebel. Romans did that. They all do it. The lease is run out, but the U.S. has stayed. We've kept it. This huge naval base. And lastly, 
Cuba could have no excessive public spending. So they can't spend a lot of money on schools or roads or sewer or electricity. So that means no debt. So the idea is they will have to be responsible. But you know what it really meant? They're going to have to pay off their creditors. Whoever loaned the money. Who loaned the money? U.S. banks. American corporations loaned the money. So basically we're saying, we're going to allow for American companies to kind of do what they want. Now two things. What kind of government is the United States then going to want in Cuba? You don't really want a democracy. Because they might say, we're not going to be a protector. This was not an agreement with Cuba. We're telling Cuba, we're going to do this. And you don't have a choice. And they have a democracy, they're going to say, no, we want to be independent. We don't want you to intervene. This is our country. We can spend our money the way we want. So what kind of government is the U.S. going to have? It's going to be dictatorship after dictatorship after dictatorship. Some really brutal ones. By the 1950s, the well, uh, uh, Batista regime was shocking in the police state they set up. They allowed in the mob to take over Havana. U.S. organized crime set up a bunch of casinos in Havana. So people with relative wealth in New York would fly down to Havana, pretty much would do whatever they want. When Fidel Castro and the revolutionaries kicked out Batista, the first thing they did is kick out the mob. Anybody know what, what, what know where organized crime went and set up their casinos? You probably already know. Have you heard of Las Vegas? That's where the mob went. And they built their, all the casinos were all started by organized crime. Now it's all run by corporations to scoop money. Back then it was all organized crime. Oh, don't get me wrong. There's still a lot of organized crime in, in Las Vegas. So if you go there, feel safe. One more thing. Guantanamo Bay is a U.S. naval base. But some of you probably know what, if you say Guantanamo Bay, they think of something else. What do they think of? Yeah. No? Anyone know? It's a prison. Never they they'll they'll cool up on the, the US Navy lingo their abbreviation Gitmo. Yeah, it's a prison. Why would you put a prison in a US naval base in Cuba? The insular cases. The constitution does not follow the flag. Cuba is a gray area because we just have a naval base in this country that actually doesn't like us. So, after the September 11th attack, what group attacked the United States on September 11th? A group called Al Qaeda. And they were in Afghanistan. Afghanistan was this horrible civil war. They were being shielded by the government in the South called Taliban, the Taliban, who are now back in power. And the U.S. got involved in the civil war. And we didn't invade, per se, we just came in to the Civil War, picked a side, and we started getting prisoners. And we didn't know if they were like, the few, there were only a couple a thousand members of Al-Qaeda. Were they Taliban? Were they just people off the street? We had no idea. We were scared to death of another attack. And the thought was, we, there just everyone's panicking. We need to find if there's more potential attacks. So the decision was made to take those prisoners and put them someplace where the Constitution does not apply. So they made a prison at the naval base in Guantanamo Bay. That still exists. As it would turn out, virtually none of the people brought there had anything to do with terrorism or anything. About 99%. But what happened to them when the United States got them into an area where they had this gray area and had no rights? What's that? They were tortured. The U.S. tortured. One guy they waterboarded 140 times, which is a torture that's so horrific it's hard to even write now. Yeah, the U.S. tortured. Now, whatever about we as a country doing that, that's why. The insular cases. Now, eventually the Supreme Court would say, no, no, it's still the U.S. naval base. But that's why the Bush administration uh, back then did that. The first president, when you were born, right? You were born under President Bush, right? And we were torturing people. It's kind of a big deal. 
So here is a Cuban cartoon. Now this is supposed to be Platt, but it shows it as McKinley. And it's kind of weird. They figure, well, that's only American that people know in Cuba. And McKinley was dead by then, but just go with it. But he's branding Cuba. It's a clever cartoon. So we have two different attitudes, don't we? Do you wonder why there's still to this day a lot of resentment against the United States in Cuba? By the way, I really want to go to Cuba. I guess it's a really cool place, especially since it's kind of in a time warp. So here's another cartoon showing Cuba doing so well, the largest cane grove. Look at this, the mountainside. Public schools. So it's, this is justifying American control, but look at the faces. They do that on purpose. They want you to think something about Cubans. Or the people who do have, with lighter colored skin, think, oh, isn't that, you know, we're superior, we're darker colored skin. We're all in that boat, and that's how they think of us. And so the peace treaty is going to be ratified. What is a little bit ironic about that newspaper headline? You see something a little weird about peace treaty being ratified? What do you notice? Peace and awful slaughter don't necessarily go together. You would hope the Philippines blew up. The Filipinos had had enough, and there was a bloody struggle outside of Manila where Filipino guerrillas tried to drive the Americans out. And this is going to lead to the Filipino insurrection. And one of the fun quirks of the English language, Philippines is spelled with PH. Filipino with an F. Ah, fun with the language. And those are Filipino civilians executed by American soldiers. The main fighting will be 1899 and 1902, even though the insurrection in many ways lasted until 1908. This was a horrible fight. This is the true price of empire. The price of empire. So it's an imperial war. And the United States try to justify this by saying we're bringing civilization. Oh, sure, we'll have a naval base to build to get American business, but that will civilize the Filipino people. Also bring Christianity. So here is McKinley, and notice how they draw the Philippines. And if he goes off the cliff, aka remains with Spain, it's off a cliff, obviously. And the world is watching. What will the United States do? Implying we have this responsibility. Remember that term, white man's burden. But there's one more thing. McKinley really laid in heavily in 1899 about Christianity. We must ratify the treaty because we need to bring Christianity to the Philippines. He even claimed he had a dream where it came to him that it is his duty to bring Christianity. There is a wave of tent revivals and re religious activity during the Panic of 1893. So he's kind of playing into that. What is wrong with these statements about bringing Christianity to the Philippines? The Philippines have been a Spanish colony since the middle of the 16th century. So for 350 years, 90% of the Filipino population was what religion? Catholic. Catholics are Christians. That's like bringing Christianity to the Christians. Why would McKinley say something like that? Now, I've got to be very clear. McKinley personally might not have had a clue. He was not the sharpest tack. But there's another really big reason why he said that. Yeah. That's actually a really good guess about the anti-Catholic bias, but that's actually not the reason. It's a really good guess, though. That's good thinking, but it's actually more than that. Most Americans, what did they know about the Philippines? So you let's assume they, they're probably cannibals. That's what they would have thought. And so they would have believed that they weren't Christians. He was taking advantage, or at least the people who knew, of the fact that many Americans were ignorant of that. He was taking advantage of holes in people's knowledge, using people's prejudices and lack of knowledge to understand something. I've told you this before. If you do not know things, information about our country or what it means, somebody will take advantage of you. 
This is taking advantage of people saying, yeah, we, we should send 270,000 American troops to go fight in the Philippines. It makes sense. Will they use that today? Of course they will. If you don't know stuff, people will cheat. I know stuff. And I'm telling you, by the way, knowing stuff does not make you smart, but it helps because you can think. If you don't know stuff, you're already in a hole. People looked at that, okay, it must be true. We won, everything's fine. So with that, Emilio Aguinaldo, who's like the, the founding father of the Philippines, he read the freedom fighter, fighting for Filipino insurrection. So the U.S. portrayed him as a freedom fighter when he's fighting against the Spanish, and then as an evil guerrilla when he's fighting against... Oh, I'll show you what else they're going to portray him as. He's portrayed as a hero and then a villain. They had to use guerrilla tactics. Most of them didn't have rifles. They had a few, some muskets. The weapon of choice for the Filipino guerrillas, the insurrection, were machetes. Needless to say, this is a bloody, horrible war. There's no prisoners taken. Eventually, 270,000 U.S. troops. That's Aguinaldo right there. He's in his 30s, but boy, he looked very young, didn't he? Filipino. But this cartoon sums up so many things. It's one of my favorite cartoons. So here it shows, it says, a game that loses much to win little. So it's talking about the fight in the Philippines. So here's McKinley. Joe McKinley is, you know, so showing them as toddlers. And there's Anna, cheering on Uncle Sam. These are American soldiers. But this was a game that was played, that kind of a carnival game. These traveling fairs would go through. And they would set up a tent and put a hole in the tent. See the hole? That's one for Aguinaldo. And somebody would stick their head through the tent, and people would pay money, kind of wait for that and try to time it, and throw, like, rotten eggs or rotten tomatoes or even manure at them. Try to hit them in the face. You know, stick their face like this. It was almost always a black man. It was just not those. You can see a lot of pictures of that. But now they're showing Aguinaldo. So this is a carnival game. So like it's, that's why it's a game. But look what he's throwing. U.S. soldiers. And you see them dying in front. That's a good cartoon. But also, it's one of those cartoons, if you didn't know about that game, about the hole in the tent, it wouldn't have made sense. So that's why context. When you read cartoons, you got to look through and see, okay, what can I know? Okay, I know you might not have known that, but now you do, right? And there's more lined up to be thrown. That's a good cartoon. It says a lot. I really appreciate that. You see, that's in other wars, too, down the road. And look how Aguinaldo and Filipinos were drawn in the American newspapers. So here's a Filipino, but look how they draw it. You can see it says Aguinaldo. And look how they draw him. He went from being a hero fighting against the Spanish to this. By the way, this was a horribly racist caricature of young, it was slave girls at first on minstrel shows called Piccadines. Just horrifically racist. And that's how they draw Aguinaldo. Once again, implying, look, we have to go civilize these people. And so, the war took on a horrible routine. Ambushed by Filipino guerrillas as American patrols were trying to find them. The thing about being American patrols, Montana sent a lot of troops here. Can't speak the language in navy blue uniforms. It wouldn't be to the end of the war, they'd go khaki. Everyone, it's weird terrain. Everybody could be the enemy. I mean, what does a guerrilla look like? Every other person. Ambush, and so, and these ambushes would be like attacks out of the jungle where they would hack up a couple American soldiers and then back up into the woods. So think about if you found your friend hacked apart with an apple, with a machete. What would you want? Let's get somebody. And so reprisals against the nearest village. What's a reprisal? Burn down the nearest village. They must be helping. And then repeat. These are the way wars for empire will be fought. This is exactly how it's going to be in Vietnam. This is exactly how it's going to be in Iraq. They're horrible. And imagine being put in that position. 
It doesn't excuse what happened on either side, but these are people put in this horrible position. So there's going to be a town called Manalabang that uh, Filipino guerrillas attacked, killed 40 American soldiers. I mean, this is horrible. Hacked them apart. It was a surprise attack. In response, at the village of Penang, General Jacob Smith, an army general, we ordered Marines, military stuff, fluid, to go to the nearest village where they thought these guerrillas might have come from, and he ordered every civilian, every person over the age of 10 to be massacred. And the U.S. soldiers lined them up, and this is the result. This is in an irrigation ditch, and those are bodies of, when I was a kid, shot by American soldiers. Now, once again, put people in this situation, the people ultimately responsible for those in charge. But these are these types of wars. This is what we call the price of empire. The U.S. started doing concentration camps just like the Spanish did. Many of the same things the U.S. claimed we went to war for, the U.S. will do in the Philippines. The Philippines, pretty soon they're going to say, Roosevelt's going to want out. And we're going to jump right to this. He's going to appoint from Ohio, William Howard Taft, to be the territorial governor. And Taft is going to start working on a peace agreement. Taft didn't want to be there, but a good soldier did his job. All he wanted to be was on the Supreme Court. <laughs> kind of lone goals. And yes, there's William Howard Taft in near Manila riding a water buffalo. Because, of course, he is. You got to admit, that's an awesome picture, right? That is an awesome picture. Well, eventually they come up with kind of a peace agreement. And this would pretty much end colonial imperialism for the United States. Economics? Sure, not colonial. So, Aguinaldo is going to be captured. And he's captured a combination of a ruse, a, a trick, but also Aguinaldo is exhausted. And he and Taft hammered out an agreement. The Filipinos will have somewhat self rule, but they'll still be a protector. But get independence on July 4th, 1946. That's, that's Filipino insurrection. The U.S really pulled back. Yes, they controlled the foreign policy, they kept forces there, but they gave a lot of self-rule. Japan's going to attack this American colony in 41, take it in 42. The U.S. will take it back in 45, but still honored their commitment and gave them their independence, but not fully. The U.S. kept a large military presence there until the Filipinos kicked out American forces in the 1980s. So then they have a very complex relationship with the United States. I think you can imagine. How do you remember the events of the Philippine insurrection? Because look at the price. Over 5,000 American soldiers died. Many from Montana. Probably three times that number would die of disease, but that was really hard to find. But look how many Filipinos died in battle. This is an estimate. But hundreds of thousands of civilians died. Many of them in these concentration camps the U.S. set up Cholera just ravaged. It's horrible disease. Cholera. They were just learning. Uh, they knew it was from fecal matter, but they just didn't set up good water system. Very complex relationship. So, this insurrection, just horrible. And it's amazing how the U.S. won the Revolutionary War in part because of using guerrilla tactics and this kind of stuff that the British did in the South, in South Carolina, North Carolina, and it's going to happen in the, in the United States. Here is imperial power, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. So, even though the Filipino insurrection was starting to go bad, most people did not know about 1900. So we had to come back to the election. McKinley's running for re-election. But you'll notice somebody there next to him. Who's this guy? Teddy Roosevelt. So what you got to put down is McKinley and Roosevelt. Roosevelt rode the fame of the Rough Riders all the way to become governor of New York at the end of that year, 1898. Out of the blue, very young but he's a progressive Republican. He's progressive. And what that means is, unlike Hannah, 
He wants to reform capitalism. And Hannah was terrified of Roosevelt. He wants to regulate business. He wants to regulate monopolies. New York was the richest and most industrial state. And Hannah by 1900 is like, we got to get this guy out of Albany, the capital of New York. What's a great way to get rid of him? He just turned 38. He's very ambitious. Let's make him vice president. Because what do vice presidents do? They break ties in the Senate, which is a big deal now, but normally not rarely happens. And what's the other thing a vice president does? What's that? Yeah, wait for the president to die. And smile and wait. <laughs> yeah, wait for the president to die. This is what we call foreshadowing. So, he jumped at it. And by the way, this is the big thing. The economy's better. McKinley's riding a wave of, you know, we won the war. They didn't realize how bad the Philippine insurrection was yet. And it says the American flag has not been planted in foreign soil to acquire more territory, but for humanity's sake. Implying it was all for civilization, and we know it's much more complex than that. The Democrats ran that guy again, William Jennings Bryan. And Bryan, I should add, you'll notice people think it's in the age, he wasn't all that old. Unfortunately, we should hear him look a little bit older. But uh, the other thing is uh, black and white photos, and everybody smoked. So when you smoke, you just, it kind of like sucks. <laughs> It's actually your youth out. Smoking's pretty amazing how that does that. Everybody smoked then. Brian ran again, but he's so tainted by going against the treaty. He's not popular in urban areas and actually did worse this time. Now, I went out of my way to find loose, the opposite of the red state, blue state thing we have now. So the blue state here is Republican, red's Democrat, because it always annoys me. I don't know why. The red state, blue state thing since 2000 annoys me. But I did, I, 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 this is my little fight against it. This is what we call relatively childish. Right? Well, Montana was still a very popular state, but McKinley did very well. Bryant's going to run again and actually do poorly again. Bryant was really popular, but you know, just he wanted to be president. And so with that, but less than a year after he is inaugurated, a wild boar got into the White House and gored President McKinley to death. And so with that, President Roosevelt stepped into office. As it says right here, Roosevelt sworn in vows to hunt down the villainous beast. So with the boar killing President McKinley, which is weird, you would think a boar? Would anybody write down boy? Please say you wrote down boy. Please say somebody wrote down a boy. <laughs> Please say you did. Okay, don't tell me. Have you ever heard of the onion? Oh, it is a satirical. Yeah, it's a satirical newspaper. Well, they they do it online, but they did a whole thing about uh, front pages for all the 20th century. So this is one. No, he was not assassinated by a boar. Yes, there are advances in ballooning science, which makes me laugh. Who assassinated him? An anarchist by the name of Leon Jagosk. If he broke down war, I know that's cruel of me. He's an anarchist, shot him in Buffalo, New York. And you know, Jagosk thought this will lead to the revolution. Acting alone. He had a gun wrapped in a towel or a handkerchief around his hand, a revolver, and from just a couple feet away, shot him. Now, Secret Service agents, I think I told you this before, after Garfield was assassinated, got to find someone to guard the president, so we'll take these cops who are supposed to stop counterfeiting, and they'll also guard the president. Still the job of the Secret Service, counterfeiting president. I just saw an ad for the Secret Service on TV about counterfeiting. It was one of those Secret Service public information ads. You know, I'm from the Secret Service. Look out for counterfeiters. But they were very well trained. And this picture makes me laugh in a very dark way. You see what I think is funny? Doesn't it look like he's using President McKinley as a shield? <laughs> you can't get me. 
Well, and now in the immortal words of Marcus Hanna, that damned cowboy is in the White House, Teddy Roosevelt. Some Democrats and a significant number of Republicans were furious that this progressive Republican was in the office. But foreign policy, oh, here's Jagas, that's in the prison. He'd be executed a month after the assassination. The revolution did not come. Teddy Roosevelt's president, and this foreign policy is going to be dubbed just right down big stick. There's a West African saying, at least he claimed, no one knows if it's true or not. They would speak softly and carry a big stick and you'll go far. And the idea was speak softly, so diplomacy, and what's the big stick? The military. And so this cartoon shows it like there's Roosevelt, the Caribbean is ours. You also see this called gunboat diplomacy. This actually comes from the British, where basically if a smaller country doesn't do what we want, we pack, we park one of our big ships and say, we will show you. And what it really is, though, Roosevelt realized the Philippines was a disaster. This is economic imperialism. Economic imperialism. That's big stick. And this is going to have lasting effects on the United States to this day. So now the United States is in the imperial game. And by the way, this shows the Caribbean, and you see big stick, and there's the Navy. And it says debt collection right there. That's a big part of it for American banks. By the way, what two things you notice most about this thing? Roosevelt is a giant, right? He's huge. But what's the scariest thing? Look at those pelicans. They could scoop up an island in their beak. By the way, who has seen brown pelicans? They are white pelicans are cool. Brown pelicans are the coolest thing. They go fishing and they just go straight into the water, then dive out. They are these big dinosaur looking birds. If birds are dinosaurs, I guess that makes me one. Moving on. Yes, I'm talking about birds. I'm a part of I can't help but to talk about birds. Jay Parker, see? And I mentioned before, I think I mentioned in here, my parents did, did not take the golden opportunity to name my, my middle name as a bird. They missed a great chance. The first time this really came into facet was 1902. Venezuela went default on their bond, on their loans made to it by mostly European banks, French and German banks. And here's an example of gun development diplomacy on the cover of Pop magazine. Here's a German, that's a German Imperial Navy, they sent a cruiser there. Here's Venezuela crying about this, but there's Uncle Sam scolding out Venezuela. And what the United States told Britain and France, I'm sorry, France and Germany, this is our hemisphere. They found the 80-year-old Monroe Doctrine that said no European intervention in this hemisphere. We've talked about this before. They dusted it off and said, this is our policy. So here's Uncle Sam saying it to Britain and Germany, the Monroe Doctrine. We will decide. Roosevelt loved that idea, that fit to his very, uh, he wanted a very muscular control of this hemisphere. And that is going to lead to what's called the Roosevelt Corollary. What does corollary mean? Corollary means like an addition to the Monroe Doctrine. Now, this is the Jeffrey Roosevelt Corollary. This is not law. This is just, just a statement of foreign policy that the U.S. is not telling the rest of Latin America. 1904. So the part of the talent, as you can read as I stand back here looming, it says, Carnic Rondo in Maine, America, as well as for all of our intervention in, by some civilized nation and in the Western Hemisphere, it's the United States. What does intervention mean? Send in the military. So the Roosevelt Corollary says the United States can intervene anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. And look at this last part. Read the last sentence here. For what reasons can the U.S. send the Marines into a Latin American country? What the heck is chronic wrongdoing or impotence in this context? What does it mean? This is what you got to get. The U.S. decides. We will decide. We were dictating to smaller and weaker countries. 
we must do what we want or we send in the Marines. In fact, the Marines were tiny. The Marines will become a big part of the U.S. military because of big stick diplomacy. So here's U.S. keeping out European powers, but in reality, we're going to step in. The first time we're going to see this is going to be, oh, don't worry about the Latin America, the Dominican Republic. Now, you know, folks, so the Dominican Republic had borrowed money bonds from U.S. banks. They went default. They went default. They couldn't make a payment on some of their bonds. Well, these banks went to the, the Roosevelt administration and said, we want our money. You like that acting? That's pretty good, huh? So what did the U.S. do? We sent off ships and sent in the naval infantry. The Marines, as an autonomous group that could invade the islands or whatever, will be started here. The Marines, as they are now, started here. They took over the government of uh, Dominican Republic, we stayed for a few years, and dictated to them that you're going to raise your taxes on your peasants, and then 55% of your tax revenues of the Dominican Republic, DR, will go to their creditors. Who are their creditors? I don't know why I have, I think I was put on the creditor's account. I don't know why I put it up. Possibly. I have no idea. Just go with it, okay? That's U.S. banks. Now, this is implying that Roosevelt's protecting Santa Domingo from, which is Dominican Republic, from Europe. No, it's U.S. banks. I should add, Dominican Republic, that's on the island of Hispaniola, on the western side is Haiti, on the eastern side is Dominican Republic. So, what a great job for the creditors. Banks are like, we made a risky business decision and loaned money to the Dominican Republic. They didn't pay it back. Bad business move, right? No! The Marines come in and we get our money. So what did banks start doing all over Latin America? The big Wall Street banking corporations started making dangerous loans all over, knowing that countries will pay it back or risk the Marines coming in. This became their business model. Their business model. And the U.S. would intervene in the Dominican Republic many more times, the last time being 1965. Heck, we've intervened in Cuba the last time was six months ago. And so that's big stick diplomacy. Economic imperialism for banks, but also for United Fruit. United Fruit became the largest agricultural corporation, American corporation, in Latin America. They came to dominate countries from Guatemala all the way down to Panama. And what did they grow? As you can see from there, bananas were of the rage by 1900. United Fruit marketed under the brand name Chiquita. In fact, they were so powerful by the 1970s, they had a banana shaped satellite orbiting the Earth, beaming banana related propaganda to the people of the world. If you squint on a very clear night, you can see the banana go across the sky. We've seen the banana. Yeah, you are right. It says Chiquita. Chiquita. Yes, Chiquita still exists. And they really pushed the idea of the banana book. Have you ever heard of the term banana republics? And a lot of people believe that's because they're countries where they have grow bananas. No, they're called banana republics because the banana company ran the country. There could be no leader of Guatemala to this day unless the United States is. And if they don't approve, we'll overthrow the government. Most famously in 1954. That's another story. And on that happy note, what does the jungle do? So. We'll finish this, Boxer Rebellion, start progressive, do the jungle. That'll be food day then. I'll, I'll start boiling hot dogs now. And peanut butter. If you ate all of them, you're welcome. I ate My mom is so You ate what? I ate two Did she deserve it? Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Have a good day, everybody. I'll see you soon. In the library. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Rob, me you find work. Just a reminder, I will be gone for Ah! Please just turn it on Friday. And I will also be on Friday. Oh, yeah. Do you want me to do it on Tuesday? If you get it, you can turn it in Tuesday or.
You get it done tomorrow, that's great. Because okay. you won't want to do it with this. And hopefully it won't be that bad, but it's, it, it'll suck. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry. Have a good day. We can have stuff in here. I think I'll just talk. All right, uh, the so-called expert. I, you know, either tomorrow or Tuesday. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.